Chapter six of Lady Barberina by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lady Barb, after this, didn't decline to see her New York acquaintances on Sunday afternoons, though she refused for the present to enter into a project of her husband's, who thought it would be pleasant she should entertain his friends on the evening of that day. Like all good Americans, Dr. Lemon devoted much consideration to the great question of how, in his native land, society was to be brought into being. It seemed to him it would help on the good cause, for which so many Americans are ready to lay down their lives, if his wife should, as he jocularly called it, open a saloon. He believed, or tried to believe, the salon now possible in New York, on condition of its being reserved entirely for adults, and in having taken a wife out of a country in which social traditions were rich and ancient, he had done something toward qualifying his own house, so splendidly qualified in all strictly material respects, to be the scene of such an effort. A charming woman, accustomed only to the best on each side, as Lady Betjeman said, what mightn't she achieve by being at home? always to adults only, in an easy, early, inspiring, comprehensive way, and on the evening of the seven when worldly engagements were least numerous? He laid this philosophy before Lady Barb, in pursuance of a theory that if she disliked New York on short acquaintance, she couldn't fail to like it on a long. Jackson believed in the New York mind, not so much, indeed, in its literary, artistic, philosophic or political achievements, as in its general quickness and nascent adaptability. He clung to this belief, for it was an indispensable neat block in the structure he was attempting to rear. The New York mind would throw its glamour over Lady Barb if she would only give it a chance, for it was thoroughly bright, responsive, and sympathetic. If she would only set up by the turn of her hand a blessed, snug social centre, a temple of interesting talk, in which this charming organ might expand, and where she might inhale its fragrance in the most convenient and luxurious way, without, as it were, getting up from her chair. If she would only just try this graceful, good-natured experiment, which would make every one like her so much too, he was sure all the wrinkles in the gilded scroll of his fate would be smoothed out. But Lady Barb didn't rise at all to his conception, and hadn't the least curiosity about the New York mind. She thought it would be extremely disagreeable to have a lot of people tumbling in on Sunday evening without being invited, and altogether her husband's sketch of the Anglo-American saloon seemed to her to suggest crude familiarity, high vociferation. She had already made a remark to him about screeching women and random extravagant laughter. She didn't tell him, for this somehow it wasn't in her power to express, and strangely enough he never completely guessed it, that she was singularly deficient in any natural or indeed acquired understanding of what a saloon might be. She had never seen or dreamed of one, and for the most part was incapable of imagining a thing she hadn't seen. She had seen great dinners, and balls, and meets, and runs, and races. She had seen garden parties, and bunches of people, mainly women, who, however, didn't screech, at dull, stuffy teas, and distinguished companies collected in splendid castles. But all this gave her no clue to a train of conversation, to any idea of a social agreement that the interest of talk, its continuity, its accumulations from season to season, shouldn't be lost. Conversation, in Lady Barb's experience, had never been continuous. In such a case it would surely have been a bore. It had been occasional and fragmentary, a trifle jerky, with allusions that were never explained. It had a dread of detail. It seldom pursued anything very far, or kept hold of it very long. There was something else she didn't say to her husband, in reference to his visions of hospitality, which was that if she should open a saloon, she had taken up the joke as well, for Lady Barb was eminently good-natured, Mrs. Vanderdecken would straightway open another, and Mrs. Vanderdecken's would be the more successful of the two. This lady, for reasons Lady Barb had not yet explored, 
passed for the great personage of New York, there were legends of her husband's family having behind them a fabulous antiquity. When this was alluded to, it was spoken of as something incalculable and lost in the dimness of time. Mrs. Vanderdecken was young, pretty, clever, incredibly pretentious, Lady Barb thought, and had a wonderfully artistic house. Ambition was expressed further in every rustle of her garments, and if she was the first lady in America, bar none, this had an immense sound, it was plain she intended to retain the character. It was not till after she had been several months in New York that Lady Barb began to perceive this easy mistress of the field, crying out, gracious goodness, before she was hurt to have flung down the glove, and when the idea presented itself, lighted up by an incident I have no space to report, she simply blushed a little, for Mrs. Vanderdecken, and held her tongue. She hadn't come to America to bandy words about precedence with such a woman as that. She had ceased to think of that convenience. Of course, one was obliged to think in England. Though an instinct of self-preservation, old and deep-seated, led her not to expose herself to occasions on which her imputed claim might be tested. This had at bottom much to do with her having, very soon after the first flush of the honours paid her on her arrival, and which seemed to her rather grossly overdone, taken the line of scarcely going out. They can't keep that up, she had said to herself, and in short she would stay, less boringly both for herself and for others, at home. She had a sense that whenever and wherever she might go forth, she should meet Mrs. Vanderdecken, who would withhold or deny or contest, or even magnanimously concede something. Poor Lady Barb could never imagine what. She didn't try to, and gave little thought to all this, for she wasn't prone to confess to herself fears, especially fears from which terror was absent. What in the world had Mrs. Vanderdecken that she, Barbara Lemon, what a name, could want. But as I have said, it abode within her as a presentiment that if she should set up a drawing-room in the foreign style, based, that is, on the suppression of prattling chits and hobbledehoys, this sharp skirmisher would be beforehand with her. The continuity of conversation, oh, that she would certainly go in for. There was no one so continuous as Mrs. Vanderdecken. Lady Barb, as I have related, didn't give her husband the surprise of confiding to him these thoughts, though she had given him some other surprises. He would have been decidedly astonished, and perhaps after a bit a little encouraged, at finding her liable to any marked form of exasperation. On the Sunday afternoon she was visible, and at one of these junctures, going into her drawing-room, he found her entertaining two ladies and a gentleman. The gentleman was Sidney Feeder and one of the ladies none other than Mrs. Vanderdecken, whose ostensible relations with her were indeed of the most cordial nature. Intending utterly to crush her, as two or three persons, not perhaps conspicuous for a narrow accuracy, gave out that she privately declared, Mrs. Vanderdecken yet wished at least to study the weak points of the invader, to penetrate herself with the character of the English girl. Lady Barb verily appeared to have for the representative of the American patriciate a mysterious fascination. Mrs. Vanderdecken couldn't take her eyes off her victim, and whatever might be her estimate of her importance, at least couldn't let her alone. "'Why does she come to see me?' poor Lady Barb asked herself. "'I'm sure I don't want to see her. She has done enough for civility long ago.' Mrs. Vanderdecken had her own reasons one of which was simply the pleasure of looking at the doctor's wife, as she habitually called the daughter of the Cantervilles. She wasn't guilty of the rashness of depreciating the appearance of so markedly fine a young woman, but professed a positive, unbounded admiration for it, defending it on many occasions against those of the superficial and stupid who pronounced her left nowhere by the best of the home-grown specimens. Whatever might have been Lady Barb's weak points, they included neither the curve of her cheek and chin, the setting of her head on her throat, nor the quietness of her deep eyes, which were as beautiful as if they had been blank like those of antique busts. 
The head is enchanting, perfectly enchanting, Mrs. Vanderdecken used to say irrelevantly, and as if there were only one head in the place. She always used to ask about the doctor, which was precisely another reason why she came. She dragged in the doctor at every turn, asking if he were often called up at night, found it the greatest of luxuries, in a word, to address Lady Barb as the wife of a medical man, and as more or less au courant of her husband's patients. The other lady, on this Sunday afternoon, was a certain little Mrs. Chu, who had the appearance of a small but very expensive doll, and was always asking Lady Barb about England, which Mrs. Vanderdecken never did. The latter discoursed on a purely American basis, and with that continuity of which mention has already been made, while Mrs. Chu engaged Sidney Feeder on topics equally local. Lady Barb liked Sidney Feeder. She only hated his name, which was constantly in her ears during the half-hour the ladies sat with her, Mrs. Chu having, like so many persons in New York, the habit which greatly annoyed her of re-apostrophizing and re-designating every one present. Lady Barb's relations with Mrs. Vanderdecken consisted mainly in wondering, while she talked, what she wanted of her, and in looking, with her sculptured eyes, at her visitor's clothes, in which there was always much to examine. Oh, Dr. Feeder! Now, Dr. Feeder! Well, Dr. Feeder! These exclamations on Mrs. Chew's lips were an undertone in Lady Barb's consciousness. When we say she liked her husband's confrère, as he never failed to describe himself, we understand that she smiled on his appearance, and gave him her hand, and asked him if he would have tea. There was nothing nasty, as they so analytically said in London, about Lady Barb, and she would have been incapable of inflicting a deliberate snub on a man who had the air of standing up so squarely to any purpose he might have in hand. But she had nothing of her own at all to say to Sidney Feeder. He apparently had the art of making her shy, more shy than usual, since she was always a little so. She discouraged him, discouraged him completely, and reduced him to naught. He wasn't a man who wanted drawing out. There was nothing of that in him. He was remarkably copious. But she seemed unable to follow him in any direction, and half the time evidently didn't know what he was saying. He tried to adapt his conversation to her needs, but when he spoke of the world, of what was going on in society, she was more at sea even than when he spoke of hospitals and laboratories and the health of the city and the progress of science. She appeared, indeed, after her first smile when he came in, which was always charming, scarcely to see him, looking past him and above him and below him, everywhere but at him, till he rose to go again, when she gave him another smile, as expressive of pleasure and of casual acquaintance as that with which she had greeted his entry. It seemed to imply that they had been having a delightful communion. He wondered what the deuce Jackson Lemon could find interesting in such a woman, and he believed his perverse, though gifted colleague, not destined to feel her, in the long run, enrich or illuminate his life. He pitied Jackson. He saw that Lady Barb, in New York, would neither assimilate nor be assimilated, and yet he was afraid, for very compassion, to betray to the poor man how the queer step he had taken, now so dreadfully irrevocable, might be going to strike most others. Sidney Feeder was a man of a strenuous conscience, who did loyal duty over much, and from the very fear he mightn't do it enough. In order not to appear to, he called upon Lady Barb heroically, in spite of pressing engagements, and week after week, enjoying his virtue himself as little as he made it fruitful for his hostess, who wondered at last what she had done to deserve this extremity of appreciation. She spoke of it to her husband, who wondered also what poor Sidney had in his head, and yet naturally shrank from damping too brutally his zeal. Between the latter's wish not to let Jackson see his marriage had made a difference, and Jackson's hesitation to reveal to him that his standard of friendship was too high, Lady Barb passed a good many of those numerous hours during which she asked herself if they were the sort of thing she had come to America for. Very little had ever passed between her and her husband 
on the subject of the most regular of her bores, a clear instinct warning her that if they were ever to have scenes she must choose the occasion well, and this odd person not being an occasion. Jackson had tacitly admitted that his confrere was anything she chose to think him. He was not a man to be guilty in a discussion of the disloyalty of damning a real friend with praise that was faint. If Lady Agatha had been less of an absentee from her sister's fireside, meanwhile, Dr. Feeder would have been better entertained, for the younger of the English pair prided herself, after several months in New York, on understanding everything that was said, on interpreting every sound, no matter from what lips the monstrous mystery fell. But Lady Agatha was never at home. She had learned to describe herself perfectly by the time she wrote her mother that she was always on the go. None of the innumerable victims of old-world tyranny, welcome to the land of freedom, had yet offered more a lavish incense to that goddess than this emancipated London debutante. She had enrolled herself in an amiable band known by the humorous name of the Terrors. A dozen young ladies of agreeable appearance, high spirits, and good wind, whose most general characteristic was that, when wanted, they were to be sought anywhere in the world but under the roof supposed to shelter them. They browsed far from the fold, and when Sidney Feeder, as sometimes happened, met Lady Agatha at other houses, she was in the hands of the irrepressible Longstraw. She had come back to her sister, but Mr. Longstraw had followed her to the door. As to passing it, he had received direct discouragement from her brother-in-law, but he could at least hang about and wait for her. It may be confided to the reader, at the risk of discounting the effect of the only passage in this very level narrative form to startle, that he never had to wait very long. When Jackson Lemon came in, his wife's visitors were on the point of leaving her, and he didn't even ask his colleague to remain, for he had something particular to say to Lady Barb. "'I haven't put to you half the questions I wanted. I've been talking so much to Dr. Feeder,' the dressy Mrs. Chu said, holding the hand of her hostess in one of her own, and toying at one of Lady Barb's ribbons with the other. "'I don't think I've anything to tell you. I think I've told people everything,' Lady Barb answered rather wearily. "'You haven't told me much,' Mrs. Vanderdecken richly radiated. "'What could one tell you? You know everything,' Jackson impatiently laughed. "'Ah, no, there are some things that are great mysteries for me,' this visitor promptly pronounced. "'I hope you're coming to me on the 17th,' she added to Lady Barb. "'On the 17th, I believe we go somewhere.' "'Do go to Mrs. Vanderdecken,' said Mrs. Chu. "'You'll see the cream of the cream.' "'Oh, gracious!' Mrs. Vanderdecken vaguely cried. "'Well, I don't care. She will, won't she, Dr. Feeder? The very pick of American society!' Mrs. Chu stuck to her point. "'Oh, I've no doubt Lady Barb will have a good time,' said Sidney Feeder. "'I'm afraid you miss the brand,' he went on, with irrelevant jocosity to Jackson's bride. He always tried the jocose when other elements had failed. "'The brand?' Jackson's bride couldn't think. "'Where are you used to ride? In the park?' "'My dear fellow, you speak as if we had met at the circus,' her husband interposed. "'I haven't married a mountebank.' "'Well, they put some stuff on the road,' Sidney Feeder explained, not holding much to his joke. "'You must miss a great many things,' said Mrs. Chu tenderly. "'I don't see what,' Mrs. Vanderdecken tinkled, "'except the fogs and the Queen.' New York's getting more and more like London. It's a pity you ought to have known us thirty years ago. You're the queen here, said Jackson Lemon, but I don't know what you know about thirty years ago. Do you think she doesn't go back? She goes back to the last century, cried Mrs. Chu. I dare say I should have liked that, said Lady Barb, but I can't imagine. And she looked at her husband, a look she often had, as if she vaguely wished him to do something. He was not called upon, however, to take any violent steps, for Mrs. Chu presently said, "'Well, Lady Barb, good-bye.' Mrs. Vanderdecken glared genially, and as for excessive meaning at her hostess and addressed a farewell, accompanied very audibly with his title, to her host. 
and Sidney Feeder made a joke about stepping on the trains of the ladies' dresses as he accompanied them to the door. Mrs. Chu had always a great deal to say at the last. She talked till she was in the street, and then she addressed that prospect. But at the end of five minutes Jackson Lemon was alone with his wife, to whom he then announced a piece of news. He prefaced it, however, by an inquiry as he came back from the hall. "'Where's Agatha, my dear?' "'I haven't the least idea. In the street, somewhere, I suppose.' "'I think you ought to know a little more.' "'How can I know about things here? I've given her up. I can do nothing with her. I don't care what she does.' "'She ought to go back to England,' Jackson said after a pause. "'She ought never to have come.' "'It was not my proposal, God knows,' he sharply returned. "'Mamma could never know what it really is,' his wife more quietly noted. "'No, it hasn't been as yet what your mother supposed. The man Longstraw wants to marry her, and has made a formal proposal. I met him half an hour ago in Madison Avenue, and he asked me to come with him into the Columbia Club. There, in the billiard-room, which to-day is empty, he opened himself, thinking evidently that in laying the matter before me he was behaving with extraordinary propriety. He tells me he's dying of love, and that she's perfectly willing to go and live in Arizona." "'So she is,' said Lady Barb. "'And what did you tell him?' "'I told him I was convinced it would never do, and that at any rate I could have nothing to say to it. I told him explicitly, in short, what I had told him virtually before. I said we should send Aggie straight back to England, and that if they had the courage they must themselves broach the question over there. "'When will you send her back?' asked Lady Barb. "'Immediately, by the very first steamer.' "'Alone, like an American girl?' "'Don't be rough, Barb,' Jackson replied. "'I shall easily find some people. Lots of them are sailing now.' "'I must take her myself,' Lady Barb observed in a moment. "'I brought her out, so I must restore her to my mother's hands.' He had expected this, and believed he was prepared for it. But when it came, he found his preparation not complete. He had no answer to make, none at least that seemed to him to go to the point. During these last weeks it had come over him with a quiet, irresistible, unmerciful force that Mrs. Dexter Freer had been right in saying to him that Sunday afternoon in German Street, the summer before, that he would find it wasn't so simple to be an American. Such a character was complicated in just the measure that she had foretold by the difficulty of domesticating any wife at all liberally chosen. The difficulty wasn't dissipated by his having taken a high tone about it. It pinched him from morning till night, it hurt him like a misfitting shoe. His high tone had given him courage when he took the great step, but he began to perceive that the highest tone in the world couldn't change the nature of things. His ears tingled as he inwardly noted that if the Dexter Freers, whom he had thought alike abject in their hopes and their fears, had been by ill luck spending the winter in New York, they would have found his predicament as good fun as they could wish. Drop by drop the conviction had entered his mind. The first drop had come in the form of a word from Lady Agatha, that if his wife should return to England she would never again later recross the Atlantic. That word from the competent source had been the touch from the outside at which often a man's fear crystallizes. What she would do, how she would resist, this he wasn't yet prepared to tell himself, but he felt every time he looked at her that the beautiful woman he had adored was filled with a dumb, insuperable, ineradicable purpose. He knew that if she should plant herself firm, no power on earth would move her, and her blooming antique beauty, and the general loftiness of her breeding, came fast to seem to him but the magnificent expression of a dense, patient, ponderous power to resist. She wasn't light, she wasn't supple, and after six months of marriage he had made up his mind that she wasn't intelligent, in spite of all which she would elude him. She had married him, she had come into his fortune and his consideration, for who was she, after all? He was on occasion so angry as to ask himself, 
remembering that in England Lady Clara's and Lady Florence's were as thick as blackberries, but she would have nothing to do, if she could help it, with his country. She had gone in to dinner first in every house in the place, but this hadn't satisfied her. It had been simple to be an American, in the good and easy sense that no one else in New York had made any difficulties. The difficulties had sprung from the very, the consummate make of her, which were after all what he had married her for, thinking they would be a fine temperamental heritage for his brood. So they would, doubtless, in the coming years, and after the brood should have appeared, but meanwhile they interfered with the best heritage of all, the nationality of his possible children. She would do indeed nothing violent, he was tolerably certain of that. She wouldn't return to England without his consent. Only when she should return it would be once for all. His one possible line, then, was not to take her back, a position replete with difficulties, since he had in a manner given his word, she herself giving none at all beyond the formal promise murmured at the altar. She had been general, but he had been specific. The settlements he had made were a part of that. His difficulties were such as he couldn't directly face. He must tack in approaching so uncertain a coast. He said to his wife presently that it would be very inconvenient for him to leave New York at that moment. She must remember their plans had been laid for a later move. He couldn't think of letting her make the voyage without him. And on the other hand, they must pack her sister off without delay. He would therefore make instant inquiry for a chaperone, and he relieved his irritation by cursing the name and every other attribute of Herman Longstraw. Lady Barb didn't trouble herself to denounce this gentleman. Her manner was that of having for a long time expected the worst. She simply remarked, after having listened to her husband for some minutes in silence, I'd quite as lief she should marry Dr. Feeder. The day after this he closeted himself for an hour with his sister-in-law, taking great pains to set forth to her the reasons why she shouldn't marry her Californian. Jackson was kind, he was affectionate, he kissed her and put his arm around her waist, he reminded her that he and she were the best of friends, and that she had always been awfully nice to him. Therefore he counted on her. She'd break her mother's heart, she'd deserve her father's curse, and she'd get him, Jackson, into a pickle from which no human power might ever disembroil him. Lady Agatha listened and cried. She returned his kiss very affectionately, and admitted that her father and mother would never consent to such a marriage, and when he told her that he had made arrangements that she should sail for Liverpool with some charming people the next day but one, she embraced him again and assured him she could never thank him enough for all the trouble he had taken about her. He flattered himself he had convinced and in some degree comforted her, and he reflected with complacency that even should his wife take it into her head, Barb would never get ready to embark for her native land between a Monday and a Wednesday. The next morning Lady Agatha failed to appear at breakfast, though, as she usually rose very late, her absence excited no immediate alarm. She hadn't rung her bell and was supposed still to be sleeping but she had never yet slept later than midday, and as this hour approached her sister went to her room. Lady Barb then discovered that she had left the house at seven o'clock in the morning and had gone to meet Mr. Longstraw at a neighbouring corner. A little note on the table explained it very succinctly, and put beyond the power of the Jackson Lemons to doubt that by the time this news reached them their wayward sister had been united to the man of her preference as closely as the laws of the state of New York could bind her. Her little note set forth that as she knew she should never be permitted to marry him, she had resolved to marry him without permission, and that directly after the ceremony, which would be of the simplest kind, they were to take a train for the far west. Our record is concerned only with the remote consequences of this affair, which made, of course, a great deal of trouble for poor Jackson. He pursued the fugitives to remote rocky fastnesses, and finally overtook them in California, but he hadn't the boldness to propose to them to separate, for he promptly made out that Herman Longstraw was at least as well married as himself. 
Lady Agatha was already popular in the new states, where the history of her elopement, emblazoned in enormous capitals, was circulated in a thousand newspapers. The question of the newspapers had been for our troubled friend one of the most definite results of his sister-in-law's coup de tête. His first thought had been of the public prints, and his first exclamation a prayer that they shouldn't get hold of the story. They had, however, got hold of it with a myriad wildly waved hands, and were scattering it broadcast over the world. Lady Barb never caught them in the act. She succeeded perfectly in not seeing what she needn't, but an affectionate friend of the family, travelling at that time in the United States, made a parcel of some of the leading journals and sent them to Lord Canterville. This missive elicited from her ladyship a letter, addressed to her son-in-law, which shook the young man's position to the base. The files of a rank vulgarity had been opened on the house of Canterville, and the noble matron demanded that in compensation for the affronts and injuries heaped upon her family, and bereaved and dishonoured as she was, she should at least be allowed to look on the face of her second daughter. "'I suppose you'll not, for very pity, be deaf to such a prayer as that,' said Lady Barb, and though loath to record a second act of weakness on the part of a man with pretensions to be strong, I may not disguise the fact that poor Jackson, who blushed dreadfully over the newspapers, and felt afresh as he read them the force of Mrs. Freer's terrible axiom, poor Jackson paid a visit to the office of the Cunarders. He said to himself later on, that it was the newspapers that had done it. He couldn't decently appear to be on their side. They made it so hard to deny that the country was impossible at a time when one was in need of all one's arguments. Lady Barb, before sailing, definitely refused to mention any week or month as the date of their prearranged return to New York. Very many weeks and months have elapsed since then, and she gives no sign of coming back. She will never fix a date. She is much missed by Mrs. Vanderdecken, who still alludes to her, still says the line of the shoulders was superb, putting the statement pensively in the past tense. Lady Betjeman and Lady Barmerduke are much disconcerted. The international project has not, in their view, received an impetus. Jackson Lemon has a house in London, and he rides in the park with his wife, who is as beautiful as the day and who a year ago presented him with a little girl exhibiting features that he already scans for the look of race, whether in hope or in fear to-day, is more than my muse has revealed. He has occasional scenes with Lady Barb, during which the look of race is very clear in her own countenance, but they never terminate in a visit to the Cunardas. He's exceedingly restless, and is constantly crossing to the continent but he returns with a certain abruptness, for he hates meeting the Dexter Freers, who seem to pervade the more comfortable parts of Europe. He dodges them in every town. Sidney Feeder feels very badly about him. It's months since Jackson has sent him any results. The excellent fellow goes very often, in a consolatory spirit, to see Mrs. Lemon, but has not yet been able to answer her standing question, Why that girl more than another? Lady Agatha Longstraw and her husband arrived a year ago in England, and Mr. Longstraw's personality had immense success during the last London season. It's not exactly known what they live on, though perfectly known that he's looking for something to do. Meanwhile, it's as good as known that their really quite responsible brother-in-law supports them. End of chapter 6 End of Lady Barbarina by Henry James